Okay, we'll get started. Welcome to Community Counts in 2020. Um, this is a program put on by the uh, White Bear Lake Area League of Women Voters. And I am Liz Lauder. I am the president of the, of the uh, chapter, the local chapter here of the League of Women Voters, which is a nonprofit organization that uh, encourages individuals to uh, be informed about and participate in government at the local, regional, state, and national levels. Uh, we hold these informational forums a couple times of the, of the year um, so that people in our community can um, learn more about important issues, uh, mostly about uh, government and about uh, voter participation. Um, we call this forum, uh, why did we call this forum um, Community Counts? Um, if you look at the website for the city of White Bear Lake, it says that the census is crucial to better understanding and representing our community. And the census not only tells us how many people live in the area, but also their age and their ethnicities. And um, these information is used by government officials and businesses and other people to determine if and where a school or a hospital or uh, an assisted living facility should be built. Uh, it also helps determine nationally important things like how many representatives the Minnesota sends to the US Congress. And uh, as one census advocate said, if you don't count yourself, you are invisible. Um, for the next 10 years, you, you don't exist. So we know that the census is important and we know why the census is important, but what can we do about making sure that we get an accurate count? Uh, what factors lead to an inaccurate count? And, and how is our community at risk for being undercounted? Uh, we've asked the Director of Census Out Operations and Engagement for the state of Minnesota, Andrew Verdon, to put the census in a context for us in White Bear Lake area um, and how we can be involved and to make sure that everyone in our community and state counts. Uh, prior to his work with the state, Mr. Verdon served as the Community Relations Specialist for the Metropolitan Council. He holds a master's degree in public affairs from the Humphrey School of the University of Minnesota. So please welcome Andrew Verdon. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Thanks for, for your warm welcome. <clears throat> Uh, I am the Director of Census Operations and Engagement, and I work for the state of Minnesota. In 2010, I worked for, this, for the Federal Census Bureau itself, which is why I know how they work, which is why I now work for the state of Minnesota. Um, <laughs> one, one of the frustrations that you have, I mean, I think the Census Bureau is very well intentioned when they do this, but they say that there shall be no difference between the way the census is conducted in Minneapolis or St. Paul, or St. Paul and Duluth, or Duluth, Minnesota and Duluth, Georgia. Because there can be no difference, right? Whatever the census's blind spots are, they must be the same for all 50 states in order for the count to be the same. Except we know that we here in the, lake, in the, in the land of Lake Wobegon, we are, we are not the same. We are not even average. We are well above average, and we're much better looking and intelligent, too. <laughs> I'm not just speaking of myself. I'm looking at this group of August citizens. I'm like, wow, this is a good-looking group. Um, so uh, 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago to the day, I, was, I, I started my work with the Census Bureau. And uh, about 10 years ago from about tomorrow, I started thinking there's got to be a better way. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm serious when I say that. Um, the census is, uh, I was just speaking at a, a forum for Congressman uh, uh, Ilhan Omar, and I say this to groups, and I mean this, the census is more important than voting. The census is more important than voting, and, and that's a bold statement to make in front of the League of Women Voters. And I've got a long ways to the door if you guys don't like that. <laughs> but I, I, I truly believe that. Because the, 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 the voting franchise is one that is limited. You have to be 18, you have to be a citizen, you have to choose to be a voter, and you have to be eligible to vote. You can't be on probation, right? So there's a number of barriers that prevent you from accessing the franchise of voting. And voting is very, very important. But I'd say that the census is more important because the census informs voting. The census decides who you get to vote for 
It determines how many reps we get in Washington, D.C. It depends. It determines who your representative in St. Paul is. It depends. Uh, it determines funding you get from the county and from the city. But it also determines um, uh, money for the programs that we care about. It, it, it funds programs that we ourselves rely on, whether you're talking about uh, good roads, clean environment, good public services, uh, emergency services, hospitals, good schools, jobs. These are things that matter to all of us. And so that's why I still, I, I stand by my assertion that the census is actually more important than voting. Um, before I well, launch into my um, uh, presentation, I'll just say uh, I appreciate all of your interest in the census. Uh, we've got something like 147 days left until the census. Who, who's counting, right? I guess this guy, I'm counting, and there's like 147 days left to the census. I'll put that in terms that, that, that might be, make it a little more real for you. There are 21 Taco Tuesdays between now <laughs> and the census. 21 Taco Tuesdays. And, uh, you know, I say that and people are like, oh, you know, that's, that's funny. I was like, yeah, but the thing is, because 147 days sounds like a lot. It's like it's on, that's on the other side of the holidays. That's on the other side of Valentine's Day. Like, I don't, I'm not sure if Groundhog Day is around there, but whatever, right? Like, 147 days sounds like a lot. All of a sudden, 21 Taco Tuesdays, you can actually make, I can see people in the audience making that calculation. You see, 21 Taco Tuesdays times three tacos a week. Like, you're calculating how many tacos away that is. And, and the, the thing is, it's not that many days. It's not that many Taco Tuesdays. And it's not that many tacos away from Census Day being here. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll move on to the, the, the fun side. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I do a variation of this speech several times a week over the, since April of last year when I started doing this job. Um, but um, even uh, an educated group like this, I think it's important to, to have some baseline knowledge because not everyone in the room is as smart as you, right? There is someone in this room who got dragged here by a spouse or a significant other and is saying, I don't know. I don't know what this is, and the rest of the presentation doesn't make sense unless we have some foundational knowledge. So uh, what is the census about? The census is about three things. It's about representation, it's about resources, and it's about data. We're talking about representation, we're talking about representation at all levels. We're talking about representation in Washington, D.C. How many Congress people does Minnesota have? It determines... Um, who your state representative is, right? The census is not going to change how many representatives there are in Minnesota, but it might actually change the line of, okay, who's your rep? That line might change on, 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 on what side of Highway 61 or which side of Highway 62 do you live may change because of a population change, right? It may change who your city council person is because that line changes, because the population within White Bear Lake has changed over the last decade. And so they want to keep all of the districts approximately the same size, so that line may move. That might be a good thing. That might be a bad thing. You might lose your favorite city council member that you've had for the last 10 years, or you might look into, a, into, into, into one that you're like, yeah, no, that's my person. Um, it's about distribution of resources. We're talking about money that comes from Washington, D.C. to Minnesota. We're talking about money that comes from, from Washington, D.C. to St. Paul. We're talking about money that comes to the county, all on the basis of the federal census count. We're talking about money that comes from St. Paul, state money, which is also on, on the basis of the Centennial census count, because there is only one census. It's the federal decennial census, right? Minnesota does not have the money, or have, does not have the resources to run its own census, so we rely on the federal numbers. So that's why it's so important they get that right, because how much money you get from St. Paul is also dependent on, on, on the census. Um, the county makes determinations of where to make investments on that basis. The city makes, de makes determinations of where to invest their money on the basis of this decennial census count. And uh, lastly, it's about data. It's about data, and that's one I think that, that, that is maybe underappreciated. The census is ultimately, it's, this is a federal government program, right? The federal gov the feds are the ones who run the census. They're the ones who open the offices, who hire the people, who train the folks, who go out and do the counting. But government aren't the only ones that use this information. Nonprofits use this information in order to determine where are the populations that we serve. Um, uh, businesses use this information to determine where do we put the next CVS? 
Where do we put the next Target? Where, where do we put the next McDonald's? And when you think about those types of investments that, the, that businesses are making, think of it not only in terms of that means maybe I don't have to get on a bus in order to be able to pick up a prescription, right? Maybe I don't have to get a ride in order to go see my doctor because maybe, maybe they'll open up a clinic right in my neighborhood. But it also means jobs for people in the neighborhood as well. That means that they don't have to f fight their way to St. Paul in order to work. And they can stay right here. They can s save on that commute, right? So that's, that's uh, uh, extremely important as well. So we all need the census. We all rely on the census. It's important for our politics. Um, it's important for our pocketbook. Um, and it's important for all of the other things from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed at night um, uh, for the census. Go ahead, please. This is a map of the United States following the 2010 census, right? So at, at, at the end of every census, there is a re, um, uh, they, they redistribute political power on the basis of these, of these figures. The states in gray, as you'll see, are those which kept their seats. The states in orange are those which lost, and the states in blue are those which gained a seat. And because we're on television, I'm not going to do the, my usual question answer thing. I will simply, I will ask questions of myself. It might look a little weird, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> the states in orange, where are they located and what kind of, what kind of weather are they experiencing right now? It's cold. it's cold, right? It's our weather, right? There's a pejorative term that some people use to describe this area of the country. Sometimes they call it the Rust Belt, right? So a lot of, these are states in the north, these are states in the east. And those are the states in the orange which lost congressional seats last time. Except we've got that uh, six down there, down in Louisiana. And ask yourself, what could have possibly have happened in Louisiana before the 2010 census which caused a lot of people to leave in a hurry? Katrina. Katrina, right? It's, it's staggering to think that, that that weather event had such an effect that actually caused Louisiana to lose a congressperson. That's how many people left. Let that sink in for a moment. And that was uh, to the benefit of Texas and Florida and, and, and Georgia, who, who gained from, from Louisiana's loss. So then let's, let's turn our head to the, to the states in blue. These are states which are largely in the south and the west. They tend to be warmer. They've got this phenomenon called snowbirds. I guess we do too, except we're the exporter. They were the importer of the snowbirds. Um, so these states all gained seats last time. Now you've got uh, Washington State up in, the, uh, up in the top corner with the number 10 on it. What's going on in Washington State which might have caused people to go to Washington State? Microsoft, Amazon, Microsoft, Amazon Boeing, jobs, right? If we weren't on TV, I'd tell you a funny story. What another audience told me what their theory was as to why people were moving to Washington State. I'll tell you after if you're interested. <laughs> uh, names will be changed to protect the innocent. Um, so yeah, so Washington State gained because of, because of because of jobs. So there are, as this body knows, there are 435 seats in the U.S. Congress. Um, Minnesota has eight of them. Minnesota, in fact, got the 435th of the 435 seats in Congress. Does anyone know what the margin by which we held it was? Thousands. Thousands. Yeah, thousands. We're talking like Frank and Dayton territory. 8,739 people. For a state of 5.33 million people, 8,739 was our margin. Had we counted... And remember, the census is an actual enumeration of people. Had we counted 8,740 fewer people, Missouri would be gray and would have a nine, and Minnesota would be orange and would have a seven. Now, Minnesota has had eight or more congressional representatives for 100 years. And we're not going down on my watch. <laughs> You know, here's the thing. Minnesota does very well in census participation rate, just like we do in other civic matters, right? We vote at very high uh, rates. We participate in the census at high rates. We volunteer at high rates. We, we had the second highest participation rate in the census in, in 2010. 
81%. That's pretty good. Number two is pretty good. What crushes me is who we lost to. What would be the worst state in the world we could possibly lose that to? Worse than Mississippi. Even worse than Iowa. Wisconsin. Yeah. Wisconsin. I don't like losing to Wisconsin anything. I, I don't like it when the when the Gophers lose. I don't like it when the Vikings lose. I don't like it when the Twins lose to them. I don't like losing to them politically, and I don't want to lose to them in the census. The good news, I guess, for us is that the state of Wisconsin is not spending any money on the census this year. And they also, there's no staff in the state of Wisconsin working on the census. There's one person who works out, I think, out at the University of um, Wisconsin in Madison who it's part of his duties, but he has no real authority and he has no budget and zero staff. And he has zero dollars from the state legislature. The bad news for me is that means I have zero excuse not to beat Wisconsin. <laughs> Our legislature uh, granted us $1.6 million. $1.6 million for the census. That's 26 cents per person. That's what we're spending on the census. And um, well, I guess we're worth 26 cents more than what the state of Wisconsin thinks their people are worth. Uh, California, on the other hand, is spending like $189 million on the census. That's four, almost $5 per person is what they're spending. Um, but I've got a really good team. And we've got some really great partners. Uh, which is why I'm, uh, which is why I'm confident that we will retain our uh, our seat. Um, the bad news is Minnesota is once again on the cusp. For the third decennial census in a row, we are at risk of losing our eighth congressional seat. The margin of error is small. Ten to twenty-seven thousand people is what they estimate. If we were to lose our seat, that is the margin by which we would lose it. 10 to 27,000 people. That's the difference of us keeping or losing our eighth congressional seat. The good news is this. According to the census, 17.7% of our state will not fill out their form on their own. They will not self-respond to their form. That's 965,000 people. I was a history major, not a math major. Let me just see if I can do this. So. Uh, 27,000 into 965,000, call it 3%. If we can get 3% of the people who would otherwise not fill out their form to fill out their form, that in and of itself could be the difference to keep our eighth congressional seat. I think that's a positive thing because what that says to me is it's possible. 10 to 27,000 people says a, a, a little here, a little there, if we can get a couple more college students to fill out the form, if we can get a couple more snowboards to fill out the form, if we can get a couple more, uh, if we can get more renters to fill out the form, if we can get non-native, more na non-native English speakers to fill out the form, if we can get more people who live in apartment buildings and all these other categories of uh, which make you less likely to be counted by the form. If we can get 3% of those people to fill out the form, that means we, that means we win. So we can do it. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. No. <laughs> I was just going to leave it on you guys. And 3%, three, three you can do 3%. Let's go to the next slide, please. So what are we talking about here? When we talk about money, you know, I worked for the census in 2010. The talking points they gave the enumerators, if someone was giving you a, a hassle at the door and says, you know, I'm not giving you my information, you say, well, this is about money. And they would say, well, how much money? And the Census Bureau workers were like, I don't know, which is not a really persuasive argument. It's about money. Okay, are we talking about like the kind of money I can, might find in my couch cushions? Or are we talking about real money? Well, so George Washington University did a study uh, called Counting for Dollars, and they actually looked at by a state, on a state-by-state -state basis how much each state gets on, from federal money, federal programs, uh, for the 55 largest federal programs. It's $800 billion a year from, um, sorry, yeah, $800 billion a year from the federal government to the states, $15.5 billion of that belongs to Minnesota. $15.5 billion. On a per capita basis, that's $2,796 per person, or almost $28,000 per person per decade in federal money comes in Minnesota on the basis of the decennial census count. 
as they say, a million here, a million there, pretty soon you're talking real money. This is real money. $28,000 per person per decade. Every man, woman, and child. So this is, this is very important. Go ahead, please. So let's take, a, let's take a look at what some of the challenges we're facing in the 2020 census. If, you are, if you're able to see the, the board here, these are not all unique to 2020. Some of these challenges existed in 2010 as well, but some of these challenges have, have gotten worse, have become more pronounced. Let's talk about a couple of them. One, there's a constrained fiscal environment on the federal level. It means the federal government is not spending much, as much money on the census this time as they have in years past. Um, and that's had real implications. The Census Bureau is going to have half as many offices as they had last time, and they're only going to have about 40% as many workers as last time. Now, part of the reason, as we'll get into later, part of the reason is this is going to be the first digital census. This is the first time you're going to be able to answer your census online. And the Census Bureau believes because it's going to be online, it's going to be so darn easy that people will just run to their computers as soon as they get the postcard and just fill it out. Good thing there haven't been any bad stories in the news about hacking or identity theft or any of that stuff or your stuff getting stolen by the Russians to, to deal with this, right? All right, so, so that's an issue. The constrained fiscal environment, the federal government Two years before the census, they're supposed to do a, a, an, what's called an end-to-end -end test. It's supposed to be a complete test of the census two years in advance. They're supposed to test all elements of the census. And usually they do three tests na nationwide. It's supposed to be a, an urban test, a rural test, and a test on a Native American reservation. This time, because of budget cuts, they only did one test for the whole country, Providence, Rhode Island. Has anyone been to Providence, Rhode Island? Who thinks that Providence, Rhode Island reminds them of Minnesota? They've got a lot less Norwegians and Ludafisk out there, although they've got, sorry to say it, better Italian food. But so the thing is, only testing the census in one place and a place that, that may be not representative of the rest of the country has some implications, right? So we think the digital census is going to work, or at least it worked better in Providence, Rhode Island, but we don't know how it's going to work in Minnesota or in greater Minnesota or, or um, in Mille Lacs, right? Um, as you all heard, there was, a, there was a controversial question about citizenship that was supposed to be added to the form. Um, you know, the, the ironic thing is when they were testing the 2020 census, that question was not included. So if that question had been included on the questionnaire, Census Bureau had no actual idea what the impact of asking the question was because when they ran the test, it wasn't included in the test. Sigh. Um, there are rapidly changing uses of technology, right? Think about where you were, technologically speaking, 10 years ago. Did you have a smartphone? Were you on social media? Did you have Facebook? <laughs> Probably not. I wasn't. Certainly wasn't. I wasn't as attached, like <laughs> physically attached to my phone as I am now. As even as I speak, I'm like, wait. I think I. I hope I left it in my car. <laughs> um, there's an information explosion. There's an information. There's a misinformation or disinformation explosion. There's a phenomenon known as fake news. You may have heard of. The internet is great, social media is great, and it can be used to spread good messages, fun, nice things that warm your heart like cat videos, but it can also be used to, dis to, to spread fear, hate, and division. And the fear is that, that, same, that some bad actors may try to use social media in order to discourage some people from participating in the census. This is an interesting story. This is a little aside, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, you know, in 1920, we had a spoiled census in America. Spoiled census is a census where, where the census did not count. And it was because that was the first census where it showed America was a majority urban country and majority immigrant country. And the Congress did not accept that. And so they left the lines as is and waited until 2030, uh, sorry, 1930 before the lines were redrawn and, and the money was allocated differently. 
because the Congress did not accept. We do not accept that this is now an urban country. We do not accept this is a, this is an immigrant country. We do not expect this will be a spoiled census. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to be without our challenges. Distrust in government is nothing new. I worked uh, on the census when Barack Obama was president. I had a gentleman who told I was working in Minneapolis at the time. I was in Loring Park neighborhood, and he lived in an apartment in the city. And he told me, I don't want the government to know I'm here. And I said, sir, you live in an apartment in Loring Park in Minneapolis. I'm guessing they know you're here. This would be different had I run into him, say, in his hovel on uh, Lake Superior as he was rendering soap. <laughs> sir, you have a cell phone. They know you're here. <laughs> um, declining response rates is nothing new. That's, that's becoming more and more pronounced. Um, you can't go to the store, you can't get a sandwich, you can't go to Starbucks without getting three surveys. How was our survey? How was, you know, how was picking up cat litter at Target? I, you know what? It was cat litter, okay? I'm sure it's fine. I'll let you know if there's any complaints, okay? Um, but, but we're overwhelmed by this, right? We get texts, we get emails, we get phone calls. Everyone wants to know, how's my service? You're like, it was, seriously, it was cat litter. Don't worry about it. Um, Minnesota, like the United States, we have an increasingly diverse population, which I believe is the strength of our country. But that uh, creates some challenges for us as well. The Census Bureau only supports 13 languages. So you can get your form in English and Spanish, or you can go online and you can get it in English and 12 other languages, or you can call a toll-free number and you can speak to a live operator and you can, you can use one of 13 languages to get through which is great if you speak Spanish or Portuguese or Polish or Russian or French or German or French Creole or Mandarin Chinese or Korean or Tagalog. Give you a couple languages that are not included that impact us here. Mong, Karen, Somali. Good. Good. We do indeed. We do indeed. We do indeed. But this goes back to what I said in the beginning. Census Bureau says there can't be any differentiation between one state and another, and because they are only supporting the 13 largest languages, there is no exception. So while Somali, Hmong, or Korean are more prevalent here nationwide, not so much. Therefore, is it any surprise if you're Somali and you don't speak English very well, and you get a form from, you get something from the federal government, from the census, and they're asking you all these questions, and oh, by the way, it's not even written in the language I understand or can read. Maybe I, maybe I don't fill out that form. I could explain why, the, according to the Census Bureau, there's 48,800 Somalis in the state of Minnesota. That's their estimate, 48,800. My Somali friends laugh when I tell them that. Um, a friend of mine from Minneapolis said to me last year when I shared that number with him, he says, 48,000. He says, I had that many in my birthday party last year. And I, <laughs> he says, I didn't invite any of my friends from St. Paul. <laughs> um, so the, the, serious, the serious side of that, though, what he said to me is, well, then, then, then that, now I understand. He said, now I understand why, why it takes longer to wait for a translator if you go to the hospital than it does for me to see a doctor because the government doesn't even know I'm here. Is it any wonder that the um, uh, Hmong family or Somali family, when they go, uh, the, say the parents are going to parent-teacher night with their child mm -hmm. to go to speak to the teacher. Maybe they can't communicate directly with the teacher if there's not a translator there, that maybe the parents aren't getting appropriate feedback on their child and how their child's performance in school, right? You, if, if it was said at the forum I was at earlier today, if you're not counted, you don't count. That's a terrifying way to think about it. If you're not counted, you don't count. And so in that situation, because the government thinks there's 48,800 Somalis in Minnesota, means that the state of Minnesota and Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis and White Bear Lake plans accordingly for 48,800 Somalis, as far as we're talking about like language training, job training, translators, and all of the other services that we might use, right? And they're not alone. They're not alone. I'm not, I'm not I don't want anyone to misconstrue that I'm picking on small. This is, this is a statement of fact, and this is true for many of our immigrant populations. Um, 
you have many people living in what are known as informal complex living arrangements. What that means is not necessarily husband and wife living together in, with their 2.2 kids in a house. It could be, it could be uh, partners living together, right? Could be a boyfriend and girlfriend live together for a long time, but they're not married. It could be a bunch of college buddies all living together because the rent is kind of high and they're all kind of crammed in there, maybe in a house in Dickey Town or something, right? Um, that's very challenging. And we also have a highly mobile population, right? People move around a lot. Renters move around a lot. People move around a lot. And it's hard to be connected for the same reason that someone might be moving around a lot means they're less likely to participate in government by voting in government and, and joining the school board and doing these things because uh, this is not, I'm not, I don't live here. I mean, I, yes, I live here, but I'm not from here. I'm not staying here. I'm moving around. And so they're hard to, hard to catch, hard, hard to, hard to um, communicate with. And that would include people experiencing homelessness as well, right? Staggering number of people experience homelessness in, in Minnesota. I heard something recently and said the estimate is that one quarter of all children in Minneapolis public schools do not have a per, do not have a permanent home. One quarter, one quarter. So where do they get counted? Where do they get counted if if they if they're going from let's say if they're sheltered and they're going from shelter to shelter or staying with family or friends, or they're unsheltered? or they're staying with grandma and grandpa, right? The parents are divorced, maybe the, you know, how do those, how, how are they counted? Go ahead. So let's take a look at the form. What, what I have here is the 2010 form. Um, I should probably update that. But here's the good news, it didn't, didn't change. <laughs> And it actually is good news that it didn't change because the, the one change they wanted to make was adding a citizenship question. And, and I will not um, jump into politics. This is an apolitical organization and I am, um, I'm still wearing my state badge so I won't say anything political. What I will say is this, I work for the state demographer for the state of Minnesota, Susan Brower. Some of you may know her from like Almanac and various media. Um, and yes, she really is very charming and funny. Um, she approaches this from a data perspective to say that any change that's made to this form may impact the response rate of people re responding to the census. And the citizenship question by the, citizen, by the Census Bureau's own estimates said that six and a half million people would not have filled out the form had the question simply been on there. Six and a half million people, that's a lot. And the people that are gonna get missed are the ones who we may already have a difficult time trying to get a good, an accurate count on. Well, so the good news is the citizenship question isn't included. The bad news is we talked about it for 15 or 16 months, and then it, we, we, there was a lot of talk about that, right? There was a lot of fear being ginned up about the citizenship question, and then it kind of disappeared with a whimper. There's no fanfare. There's no Macy's Day Parade to, to talk about it. Just kind of disappeared. So, what one of the many things that keeps me up at night is thinking: How many of those six and a half million people did not get the did not get the recall memo? How many of those six and a half million people just heard? I remember I heard there was something with it, uh, and and it might do grievous harm to me or my family. Maybe answering this question, maybe answering this questionnaire that they're going to send me is going to cause me to be uprooted from my family, from my neighborhood, from my kids, from my job, from my home. You know, I'm not even touching it. I treat the census form like I would as, uh, uh, as if there was a snake in the, in the, in the letter or in a box. I'm just going to, I'm going to just let that go. Um, so... Yeah, I, I've got a long reason, a long list of reasons why I don't sleep. This is among them. So let's let's look at the questions themselves. I mean, the fact of the actually, if you go back one, please. One more. Great. So take a look at the questions themselves. They're not really that personal. How many people live at this address? What's the relationship with the person filling out this form to the other people who are in the household? Um, what's your name? What's your sex? What's your age? Are you Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? What's your race? Do you rent or own your home? I was joking about my phone earlier. Three weeks ago, I was on vacation in the Netherlands, and I lost my phone in a cab. 
First time in 20 years I've ever lost my phone, and I lost it in a cab in the Netherlands. And when I came back to the United States to get a replacement phone, I had to give Verizon Wireless more information than this to get a replacement phone. <laughs> Go ahead, lose your phone. See if I'm kidding. I had to give more information to get a, get a phone with a company that I have been with for over a decade than you have to give the federal government in order for your form to be considered complete. So the reality is, I, I guess the most, the most personal question they're asking for is your name. But that's not even a mandatory question. You don't have to give them your name. Your age, I guess. I know enough, I know enough not to ever ask a woman's age. <laughs> um, Age, um, what's your race? The fact of the matter is that most of these questions aren't very personal anyway. So, you know, people have, have, have expressed some concerns about the digital census. What if my, what if my information gets stolen? What if, what if the Census Bureau gets hacked? Something along those lines. Go ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm not inviting people to hack the census, but you can't do anything if you had this information about me anyway. Um, so let's go, go ahead to the next one. So this is important for a group like this because you are um, upstanding members in the community. You have work relationships, friend relationships, family relationships. You have your neighbors. You have uh, your members in your faith community, people you volunteer with who may ask you questions about the census. And this maybe is the most important one of all, which is, is my information safe? And the answer is, Unequivocally, yes. Any information that an individual gives on their census form is confidential for 72 years. 72 years. So the 2020 census, that information is not being released until the year 2092. Unless our friends at Medtronic and or the Mayo Clinic do some really amazing work, <laughs> I'm not going to be around when the information gets released anyway. Um, but it's important for people to know that the information is confidential. It's confidential from, from all, so all levels. The federal government can't know your information, your individual information. The state government won't know your information. The county won't know. Your city won't know. Your neighbor won't know. Your landlord won't know. Federal agencies won't know. We're talking about the FBI. We're talking about ICE. We're talking about uh, Department of Revenue, IRS. Child Protective Services, no one will know. You know, like um, school teachers have something that's called a duty to report, right? If a child shows up in their classroom with a bruise on their arm, the teacher is required by law to report, little Johnny has a bruise on their arm because they have a duty to report. Census Bureau workers do not have a duty to report. In fact, they, Census Bureau workers have a duty not to report. Census Bureau job, workers' job is not to tell what's going on in the household. They can't tell each other. Two census workers can't tell each other, guess what I just saw. Census Bureau workers can't share that information with a landlord. Census wor workers can't share that with a, with, a, with a neighbor. Census workers can't share that with anyone. And if a census worker sees something illegal going on, the census worker's job is not, is if in the course of their duty, if because they are knocking at a door and they see there's a, someone breaking the law on the other side of that door when they were answering the form. Census Bureau workers' job is not to say, yeah, there looked like there was a 17-year-old kid drinking a beer or smoking some cigarettes or doing whatever. Um, Census Bureau workers are highly motivated. They are sworn to secrecy for life, and the penalty for noncompliance is five years in federal prison and $250,000 fine. It's a big number. This is a job which at the top of the pay scale in Minnesota pays $20 an hour. I don't care how juicy what I just saw was. I'm not doing five years of federal time and paying quarter million dollars just so I can tell you, guess what I just saw? I doubt you would either. Um, Census Bureau does an excellent job of protecting one's information, and, and I've, I've heard this from uh, well-placed sources. Uh, it's actually easier to get on, on board Air Force One than it is to get into Census Bureau headquarters. It takes over an hour to get in the census headquarters. You have to give your name in advance. They do a background check. They check you when you go in. They take your phone. They cover your phone, all of the things. It takes an hour for you to get in the Census Bureau. It's longer than it takes to get through TSA. 
And here's the interesting thing. It takes half an hour to get out of the Census Bureau because then they check you when you're on your way out as well to make sure that you don't have any information with you. Census Bureau takes confidentiality very, very seriously and protects it um, uh, militantly, I'd say. Go ahead. So how will you know what to do? So when it's time to respond, you will receive an invitation in the mail. Uh, on or about March 12th to 20th, you're gonna get your first invitation from the Census Bureau. 75 to 80% of the households in Minnesota are going to get a postcard, and the postcard will invite you to go online to fill out the form. The other 20 and 25% of the households are going to get a letter, and the letter is going to say the census is coming, and then you will receive a paper form. This is important for everyone to know. Anyone can go online and fill out their form, and anyone can use the paper form. So you're not being forced to do the digital version. If you're not web savvy, if you don't have a computer at home, if you don't trust using the computer, that's fine. If you wait, a paper form will come. So you'll get a reminder later the week following, then you'll have census day on April 1, where you will not hear us um, uh, be quiet about the census, hopefully. You're gonna, you're gonna be like, oh man, the census, he, he warned us it was gonna be bad, but it's bad. Um, you're gonna get more reminder postcards, and finally the week of April 20th to 27th, you'll get a final reminder postcard before the Census Bureau will begin sending those enumerators or the census takers door to door. So you get five reminders before someone will come to your door. Um, since we're here, let's talk about that. I think you'd all agree that um, if someone does not respond to the census, to those five, five reminders, you're more likely to respond when someone knocks at your door if that person might actually be from your neighborhood. Maybe they look like you. Maybe they speak your language. You might not know them, but you might recognize them, right? And I think this is particularly important when we're talking about the historically undercounted communities. As my friend said to me, he says, Andrew, I mean, it seems like you're really knowledgeable, you care about the census. He says, but uh, I don't want to hurt your feelings or anything. He says, but you might not be the right guy for the Somali community. <laughs> Fair point. I, now, this is where I thought he was being just mean. He says, you kind of look like you could be on Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Low blow. <laughs> We're still friends. Um, but his point is well taken, right? You're more likely to respond to the census if, 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 if when someone comes to your door that they um, look like you, they might come from your faith community, they might speak your language. This doesn't mean that there's not a role for all of you in this room to play as well, but one of your roles might be help, helping find people from these diverse communities in Minnesota who are likely to be missed to get jobs with the census and work with the census, right? Great thing about, I love the, I love the League of Women Voters, I, and I'm not just saying that because I'm here, I, I love the League of Women Voters, because you've taken this on as one of your charges for 2020, and people trust the League of Women Voters. When I go to the grocery store, there's a table set up. When I go to the whiz-bang days in Edina on the 4th of July, there's a table. And I might not know the individuals sitting behind that cloth, but I do know the League of Women Voters, and I do know, okay, if I register to vote with the League of Women Voters, that's gonna go through, they're giving me good information, this is not a sham. And we're counting on that with the League of Women Voters all over the state of Minnesota to do the same thing, to do what you already do, and helping getting tens of thousands of people registered to vote, and helping people fill out their census forms. Um, so those jobs. Census said uh, that last I heard is something like 7,500 jobs in the state of Minnesota. There are going to be 7,500 jobs. That's going to take close to 40,000 applications to fill those jobs. It takes about five applicants to get one, one worker. To give you a sense of perspective, there's about 80,000 people in the state who are actively looking for work, and there's 140,000 unfilled jobs already. What do you think the chances are that half of all people looking for work are going to say to themselves, hmm, I've always wanted to be a census taker. <laughs> Given that this is a part-time position that's got a, a finite end and doesn't offer benefits, it may not be the right thing for someone who's long-term unemployed. But it's a great job for someone who's, it could be a high school student, could be a college student, could be a stay-at-home parent 
could be someone who's volunteering, could be a, someone who's retired, could, could be someone who's semi-retired, um, could be a community activist, could be someone who's working full-time but cares about democracy, cares about Minnesota, cares about White, White Bear Lake and says, you know what, I, yes, I, my plate is full, but I can go door knocking a couple nights a week. I could, go, I could door knock on Tuesday. I could door knock on a Saturday. You get to set your own schedule. But I believe your neighbors are more likely to respond when they see you at the door than if they saw me. They don't know who I am. So I encourage you to please go uh, and apply for these positions. Um, the website is www. 2020census.gov forward slash jobs. Mm -hmm. Fill out the application. The, um, you likely will not be hired until March or April. The work doesn't really begin until May and goes through June, July, and maybe in August. This is about three, three and a half months work. Um, strongly, strongly encourage everyone to apply for these positions. And if you yourself are not looking for work, maybe you have a significant other that does, maybe you have a child that does, maybe you have a neighbor that does, maybe you, you know someone in your life who might be looking for this. You know, uh, the kids call it a side hustle, right? Like this, um, instead of um, shoveling, shoveling walks during the winter, this might be a way I can make a little bit of extra money, right? Put a little money in my, in my pocket. So I'll get it back off my soapbox and we'll move on to the next slide. So what can you do? Uh, you can join a complete count committee. That's a volunteer committee that's established by a tribal, state, or local government or community leaders and it's, made, it's created to increase awareness about the census. It could be on the county level, it could be on the city level, it could even be on a neighborhood level. It could be an individual building. You could, have a, you could have an individual apartment building that says, we are going to form a complete count committee, and darn it, I'm going to make sure that everyone in my building fills out their forms. It's tremendously helpful. So if you go to our website, which is mn.gov forward slash 2020 census, you can see a live map, and you can see where all the complete count committees are around the state. We've got about 230 or so already established, which is pretty terrific. But if you go to the map and you look at the map and you don't see one in your area, congratulations, you're a CCC. Follow our website, and we'll explain how to do that. Some other chapters of the League of Women Voters have, have, have formed their own complete count committees, and you may want to do that as well. One of the reasons you might do that is you, get, uh, you can receive a mini-grant from the state of Minnesota in order to do census work. Now, it's not a princely sum. We have a total of $300,000 going out by way of community grants in our first round of funding. That's 400 grants of $750 at one, uh, 400, excuse me, 400 grants of $750. It's not a princely sum, but it's better than having to take that money out of your own pocket or out of the chapter's pocket in order to pay for uh, some printing or buying coffee for volunteers or doing anything along those lines. It's better than absorbing the cost yourself. So jobs, sorry, I stole my own thunder. 7,500 jobs necessary in 2020. Flexible part-time jobs, good paying. Actually, this, this slide is now out of date, so I'm glad I saw this. The requirements are you have to be 18, you have to be proficient in English, and you need to be able to pass a criminal background check. Being a US citizen is no longer a requirement of the job as of two weeks ago. Census Bureau is having difficulty filling these positions, and so they're being a little more expansive as to who they're, who they're granting these positions. Uh, now, our understanding is that you still do have to be authorized to be in the United States, so a legal permanent resident, a green card holder would be eligible. We do not know at this point in time whether a DACA recipient, recipient might be eligible for this, but we're hopeful that it is. And they've waived that U.S. citizen requirement for people who are bilingual especially if you speak one of the languages that the Census Bureau does not support. So if you speak Somali in English or Hmong in English or Korean in English, you're more likely to get hired because they're going to the Census Bureau's needs. People who are, who are bilingual can speak those languages. Go ahead. 
So what else can you do? You can share this information, this information that I've given you tonight. Um, go to our website, mn.gov slash 2020 census, and you can get more information about, uh, about the census. We've got some videos that we've made. We've got a census 101 and 102 video. Basically, what's the census? Why does this matter? Why should I care? We've got a college video that we just released. And the college video uh, is, is meant for college students. I live in a dorm. Where should I be counted? My girlfriend's studying in France. Can I still put her on my form? Um, my landlord doesn't know how many people actually stay in my house. Will he find out if I fill out my census form? And all those kinds of questions. Um, and there's also going to be a, there's a fourth video that we're working on now, which is an um, animated video. And it's going to be about confidentiality and citizenship question. And that's going to be available in English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong. And for other languages which we don't support, Oromo, Karin, um, Tibetan, Lao, et cetera, we're going to make that video available to them. We'll make the, 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 the video available and the script available. So if the Karin Association of Minnesota wish to overdub it themselves and put it on their social media or put it on their cable access program, they can do so. And we'll make that a video available for you as well. Um, our Census 101 video is also being reshot in by a um, Spanish family, a Somali family, and a Hmong family. So instead of watching a video and seeing my mouth move and hearing Hmong or Somali come out of it or reading Spanish across the bottom of the screen, we actually have a Spanish, Somali, and Hmong family speaking in language. So that's, um, I, I hope it's, yeah, I hope it's more inviting. I hope that people feel more welcome as, as opposed to, yeah, it's just, it's, yeah. Um, sorry, just back one screen real quick. So um, follow, our, follow us on social media. Our um, profile is at MN2020Census. That's the same on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. Um, we are building our, we're building our, our profiles, and we have a hashtag, which is hashtag WeCountMN. So if you go to Facebook and you just and you go to and you click on if you type in hashtag we count MN, hit search, you should be able to see all these posts that all these other people that not only our office but our partners all over the state have posted about why we want to count Minnesota. Um, please follow us. Um, please share this information with with people as well. So just just so you just so you understand, there there are three legs to this stool. There's the Federal Census Bureau, which is the big, the, the big blue block, right? It's their job to, to find the offices and hire the people and train the people and go out and do the counting. They are the, they are the primary responsibility for the census. Um, I guess my area of responsibility is that public leadership. That includes the Minnesota State Demographic Center, includes uh, the Department of Administration, that includes state agencies, it includes the counties, includes cities, includes the elected officials in St. Paul, the congressional delegation. Another way of thinking of this is kind of the grass tops, right? The grass tops. And then our community partners include something called the Minnesota Census Mobilization Partnership. Their members include the Minnesota Council on Foundation, the Minnesotans for the American Community Survey, uh, the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, Common Cause. Blandon Foundation, Grassroots Solutions, they're kind of the grassroots. One thing that's been impressed upon me doing this work over the last year plus is that the messenger is at least as important as the message. I think the messenger is probably more important than the message. It's all well and good that I know a lot about the census, but if you don't know me, you're less likely to take it in. But when you hear it from a friend, you hear it from someone uh, in your faith community, you hear it from uh, uh, you hear it from someone in your social network face to face. You're more likely to to embrace it, accept it, and and to um, um, move forward with it. Go ahead. So, uh, with that, I will stand to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. And for the benefit of people watching at home, um, we're going to use the microphone so that they can hear the question as well as um, Andrew. So who's about to go first, Dick? Just to clarify, so I understand this, the federal government is supplying all of the postcards and sending out all the forms, et cetera, et cetera. And 
by budgeting money in the state of Minnesota or the city of White Bear Lake, whatever. That's additional workers that are going to be hired. The federal government hires X, and there will be additional workers. And so in Wisconsin, there won't be any additional workers out finding these people. They're just going to rely on the postcards? Close. Close, or there's a little more to it than that. Yeah, the, the, the $1.6 million dollars bought you five and one quarter person. I am one of those 5.25 people. We have a state of 90,000 square miles, and we have 5.25 people working on the census. But we have all those other groups that are also working on the census. We've got those 250 complete count committees around the state working on this. We've got the Minnesota Council Foundation, all the members of the Minnesota Council nonprofits. We've got the tribes working on this. Right? So we have a lot more than just the 5.25 people, but that's that's all the state of Minnesota actually has. But that's 5.25 more people than Wisconsin has. And so, so yeah, it's it's staggering to me to think that like a state like Texas, zero dollars, zero staff, zero dollars, zero staff. So, yeah, and you know Minnesota historically does a lot better than the rest of the country. We finished 81% in 2010. The national average is 73%. That's staggering. That's staggering to think that the national address is 73 percent. I bet you Texas is below that number. It seems to me maybe they'd like to spend some money to help make the count better, but you know, what do I know? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's staggering. I mean, I think it's just I think it's 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 smart policy by the state of Minnesota to invest the money. I think it's smart policy by Ramsey County, by the counties, by the cities. All of these by these organizations to spend money to because because you get the money back uh, it's it's a, a wise investment is what I'd say. Yeah. Uh, just following up on the issue of getting data and information from underrepresented communities, uh, do uh, can the public monitor real time responses and response rates uh, for particular communities while the census account is going on? This feels like a, a planted question. That is so great. I love it. <laughs> and, and how will the state officials use real-time response rate information to target areas with lower response rates? Yeah, great. Um, that's awesome. I got ambushed with a great question. Uh, so yes, uh, actually, I'm glad you asked the question. Yes, the Federal Census Bureau will provide uh, live updates on response rates on a census tract level. So it won't say Mr. Jones in apartment 1C has, has finally answered his census form, but it will say, it'll say this census tract has a 42% response rate. This census tract is a 37% uh, response rate, and it's updated on a daily basis. So the city of White Bear Lake could use that information to say, "Ooh, we need to get over the, that side of Highway 61," or "Oh, we should." Or the League of Women Voters could say, "All right, we need to go over to the to the Rainbow Foods and go over in that neighborhood, right?" So, you, so that you could do some live, you could do some live time stuff. State, state of Minnesota again with our 5.25 people. Um, uh, we will certainly be sounding the alarms like Paul Revere when we see these things happening and letting people know, you know, what areas are the best places for us to, uh, uh, for um, resources to be uh, invested in. How much time do you have? So folks have from basically March 12th to April 27th to self-respond to the form. Actually, you can self-respond beyond that, but that's known as the self-response period. And then after April 27th is what's called NARFU, non-response follow-up. That's not a joke, non-response follow-up. And that is, uh, it's about three to three and a half months when the Census Bureau workers will start going door to door. Now, if you were to fill out your form on your own on May 15th, even though it's in the non-response, the non-response follow-up period, your form still counts and you would still be able to self-respond to your form all the way to the end. Now, we talked about how the, the Census Bureau had, had cut its resources. Among the things they cut, not only are there fewer enumerators, um, but um, the enumerators will have fewer visits. In 2010, the enumerators used to have six attempts at any one address, and this time we've been told it may be cut as little, low as three. So, so the point is you're going to have time if there's a low response area to go and correct it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, if, so if, if, if there's a low response area, there's still time to correct. So I have a question about the gender question, and maybe this is for the 2030 census, but I'm curious if the federal government is considering, a, you know, an addition since more people to the 
options because more people are identifying as non non-binary. Um, yeah. So there was a attempt for this census to change the question from what is your sex to what is your gender, and that would that would offer non-binary options. Um, that did not happen in this census, and so but we are hopeful that the government will take these changes into consideration for future censuses. You know, there's a fascinating, um, I'm trying to remember who did this, it might have been Salon, did a fascinating study about how race is categorized with the census, going all the way back to 1790. And you can see how, how, how race used to be on the form, and you can see the evolution, how we got to now. And I think, I think as a country, we may be there the Census Bureau is usually not the progressive leading indicator of the thing. They, I think they tend to follow trends. Um, so um, just like now, there's, there's a question, question about both ethnicity and race. So question eight is, are you Hispanic, Latino, or uh, Spanish origin? And, the, and then question nine is, what is your race? People say, well, geez, I don't understand. What's the, you know, what's the difference between the two? I'll use myself as an example. I'm Brazilian born. My, both of my parents are Brazilian. Both my birth parents are Brazilian. Uh, my adopted parents are both from Minnesota, which is why I'm here in this lovely polar vortex land. <laughs> um, so, so I would answer the question, yes, I'm Latino, because I'm, I'm, uh, I was born in Brazil. And for a race, I could, I could, check, multiple, I could check multiple races. Because it, just like it's possible to be, say, Cuban and black or Cuban and white, so I'm, I'm Brazilian and white and black and lots of other things. So um, we are hopeful that, that in future censuses that, that, that change will, will, will be reflected. Could, could you compare the amount of money spent in 2010 to what's being spent in 2020? You, you talked about numbers of people uh, in the nu in numerators. Yeah. So in 2010, there was like 500 offices in the country, and there's only going to be 248 this time. There were 1.1 million enumerators last time. There's 500,000 this time. So the numbers, the, you know, the numbers go way, way down. Um, I can only tell you this, having worked at the Census Bureau in 2010. <laughs> You could pretty much clothe yourself head to toe in census gear in 2010. You could get a hat, you could get a baseball cap, you could get a mitts, you could get sweatbands, you could get, there were beer koozies and there was a census soup bowl. I'm not sure why, but there was. There were frisbees. There were, I mean, there was, I, I didn't see any tennis shoes, but I, that doesn't mean they didn't exist. That doesn't exist this time. And that's one of the, one of the ways that the, this, just the census is just not as, um, as visible as, as it was in years past. So um, here's where my confidence that Minnesota is going to fare very well. In fact, I'll, I'll go ahead and put it out there because we're on TV. We're going to be number one in census participation this time. We're going to be number one. And um, in part, because the Census Bureau is not funded at the levels it was before, and because a lot of states like our friends, Wisconsin, are spending no money and have no staff to work on this thing, means that they are completely relying on the federal government. They're completely relying on the, on the Census Bureau getting their count right. It's not meant as a slam against the federal government and or the Census Bureau, but it's a statement of fact, which means that in Wisconsin right now, there is not a, there is not a, there is not a, a me having a conversation with a you in a room like this. Minnesota's been working on the census for years. 2016, 2017, Minnesota's been working on the census. We have money, we have staff, we have people, we're having conversations, and other states just don't have that. So that's why I'm confident that, that we will fare well because, because we do have money and we do have people. So I have a challenge question follow-up to that. Okay. So we, we often tout how great we are in Minnesota and things like home ownership and graduation rates and voter rates, but when you look and you break it down by race, that's not the case. So. I want to challenge you to to track that by race, and I'm, I'm yeah. hoping that we will. Absolutely, um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because those disparities are real in Minnesota, 
right? We have high high school graduation rate, high college graduation rate, high home ownership rate, high income rate. If you're white, but if you're black, brown, indigenous, or an immigrant, those numbers go down, and the, and, and, and census participation rates follows almost directly. If you were to over, overlay a, a, a map of census participation rates, I can, I can, only, I can speak for, for Minneapolis, because that's where I worked in 2010. If you were to look at census participation rates and put that over the map of Minneapolis, you'd see that a affluent neighborhood like Kenwood, or Lake the Isles, or Lake Calhoun, got a 97% participation rate. It's got a 98% participation rate. Hey, honey, look, the federal government would like some information. Would you like to fill it out or should I? Let's fill it out. No, you filled out the last one. Okay, I'll fill it out. I don't, I, that's maybe a terrible imitation of people who live in Lake of the Isles. I don't actually know any of them. <laughs> but I, that's what I imagine in my, my head when I think about it. But if you look at a more diverse area like the Whittier neighborhood or Cedar Riverside or, uh, neighborhood or North Minneapolis, that census participation rate plummets. And, and I'm not putting it on the people who live in those neighborhoods. If there's an argument to be made, or some might say, if you live in Lake of the Isles or the Kenwood neighborhood or, or Cal Lake Cal uh, formerly Lake Calhoun area, government works for you. So I don't have any fear of participating in this thing. I get government services. I can call 911 without fear. My trash gets picked up, right? But if you live, but if you're working multiple jobs, if you're in a less affluent area where you don't enjoy the same positive relationship with government, um, if the form isn't even available in a language that you speak, is it any surprise that people don't participate at the same rates? Absolutely not. So while I, who works for the state of Minnesota, I'm concerned that all Minnesotans get counted, the fact of the matter is that the, the, the real measure of our success is going to be how the communities of color, how the low wealth communities, and how the immigrant communities participate. The 48,800 Somalis here, there's a lot of room to grow. There's a, there's a lot, of, I mean, again, if you were to listen to my Somali friends, they would say that, that that's maybe half of the number of Somalis in Minnesota. So there's a lot of room for, for growth. But, it, but if you're Somali and you live in an apartment and you've got multiple generations living in the same household, the form is not available in the language you speak, or if you're an immigrant or a refugee where you come from, the, the census is used as a tool of oppression. The Karin, and someone, I was at a, a forum for immigrants and refugees recently, and someone was speaking about the Karin community. They were Karin themselves, and they said, yeah, in our country, it was used to segregate us. It was used to figure out where the Karin, and then to keep us out of the good jobs and keep us out of the good schools, right? So the opportunity for, for us to improve, frankly, is within the communities of color. So I appreciate the challenge and accept it. My question is, um, we've been talking about the short form. There is a long form. What percentage of people get that? And how do you, in, to follow up on the previous question, how does the Bureau ensure that an accurate percent of the various types of population get the long form? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that. So um, there used to be both a long and a short form. And then in 2010, it just went to a short form, right? So there is still a long form, but that's now called the American Community Survey. And the American Community Survey is every year, and the American Community Survey goes to one out of every 34 households. And so it goes to every one, one out of every 34 households, and so it's meant to give information in between censuses. And then on that basis, they're essentially using sampling to say, every year the census will release information and say, uh, income for women in Minnesota is up 7%, in for, in, uh, income for African Americans is up 5%. And, and so they're, they're using sampling to be able to say, based on the one out of 34 households that we did sample, here's what we got. But as far as the decennial census count is concerned, so that means appropriation of um, uh, of political representation and of actual money. It has to be an actual enumeration. It has to be actual actual people counted. Sampling can't be used in order to make that. But I'm glad you asked because 
people ask that all the time. I, I get I get calls at the office where people say, well, I already filled out my census form. I don't have to fill it out next year, right? I said, no, you still do. Or, you know, I thought they weren't supposed to ask so many questions. Why do they want to know how many bathrooms I have? Well, okay, because you've got the long form. Now, now, I work with a bunch of nerds. They're probably not watching this, but I'll say it. They're, I work with a bunch of nerds, and they, I, they literally are like, ooh, I hope I get the long form. <laughs> <laughs> Not me, <laughs> not me. I'm the coolest of the nerds, I think, or the nerdiest of the cool people. I don't know, whatever it is. But I, I don't hope I get, I mean, I think it would be interesting, but I, it's fine if someone else can do it for me. Question about oversight. So you've got a bunch of volunteers out, some of them are high school kids and so on. Uh, in, in university, you know, there, there's a term called dry labbing. How do you know somebody doesn't go out and just, fill out a bunch of these so they look really good. Do, yeah. do you have some kind of check to make sure that doesn't happen? The Census Bureau does, yes. First of all, the positions that I was referring to are actually paid positions. So everyone who works for the Census Bureau is our sworn employees. They are paid. They are trained. Census Bureau employees, because, uh, because this is a new digital census, all get iPhones, and the iPhones have the information. And from that, they're able to track where you actually went. So if you come back and say, hey, I, I counted 10,000 people today, they say, well, don't really? Where? Um, the Census Bureau also does, uh, also has a very regular uh, quality assurance check. So where they, they do a random sample of the forms that are turned back to them by the enumerators, where they'll send, uh, send a, a quality check person to the door saying, hello, are you Mr. Jones? Yes, okay, great. I, I understand that one of, our, one of our people came to your door recently and, and gathered some information. Is, is this correct? And then they'll go through that information. Now, likewise, um, the unique identifier as far as the census is concerned is your address. So the Census Bureau gets different, they can get, different information about the same household as long as that different information is the same, right? Like, let's say the wife fills out the form and the husband fills out the form somehow. Uh, let's say the wife fills out the form at the lake home and the husband fills out the home, the form at their, at their primary residence, right? Um, or one fills it out at the grocery store, doesn't realize that the other has already filled it out. As long as the information agrees, it's okay. If, you know, one fills out the form and says, yes, we have three kids, and the other one says, nope, oh, no children here. Uh, <laughs> this might be a good opportunity for the, for the two adults to have a conversation. <laughs> so, but I appreciate you asking the question, and yes, the census is, uh, does take this very seriously. Um, uh, you know, some groups are actually overcounted, right? And, some, and, and they tend to skew more affluent because it's because a form is sent to every address in the United States. You know, if, if you use winter as a verb, uh, you get a form at your home in Florida and you get one you form, at, you know, here in Minnesota, right? So now it's not forwardable mail. So your Minnesota form won't get sent to you in Florida. And if you, but if you live in Minnesota, if you spend more than six months and a day in Minnesota, this is your primary residence, for God's sake, fill out your form to say that you're from Minnesota. My litmus test is this. Say to my aunt and uncle who are from Little Falls and they spend their time in uh, near Orlando for the winter. But they don't spend more than six months down in Florida. They just, they go to, lead, to, to um, miss the worst of winter. And I say, well, are you a Twins fan or do you, <laughs> or do you cheer for the Tampa Bay Rays? See, because that's a trick question. <laughs> No one cheers for the race. <laughs> so fill out your form as a Minnesotan. Follow your heart. Um, because, because we get the political representation for the next 10 years. We get the federal funding for the next 10 years. Not telling anyone to lie. Do not lie in your census form. But you know, to my dear aunt and uncle, if you are watching, fill out your form in Minnesota. Um, I wanted to, looking at the form that you had there, I recall in 2010, uh, the form, we got a paper form, and it was like on a legal size piece of paper. It was in three parts. You turned it over, there were three parts, uh, where the first part asked for 
the family living in that household? And then the next part was, is there another family living in that household? And then is there a rumor, uh, uh, somebody renting a room? Mm -hmm. And it went on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is and, that and, also and, going to yeah, be? Yeah, same, same with this form. So I think it's, because it's important for people to understand there's one form per household, meaning one form per address. address. But you have situations where there might be multiple families living in a single address. With the Census Bureau, just because we're trying to get an actual count of all persons living in the United States, we just don't, we don't want just the Jones family who happened to pick up the mail and got the, got the form for the address. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that everyone in the household, whether they're related or not, also gets counted. So that's the purpose of that type of form. So the form really does is not just that one page. It's not that just you the show. one page, but it's the ten it's the ten questions, and it's ten questions per person who lives in the household. Right. Uh, how will you accommodate, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, immigrants who are living in Minnesota. How, how will you accommodate them? You, you mentioned the videos that will be made uh, with people who are Hispanic or among. Uh, how, will, how can you access those videos? So the, the, I'm glad you asked. So the videos are available on our website, and as they are continuing to be produced, we will continue to push them out. The videos will also be made to our media partners. They were created by TPT Television, but we own the rights to them. So, so which means we have the digital rights to them. They could be broadcast on cable access channels. Uh, they can be put on uh, Univision TV. They can be put on. Um, uh, they can be put on uh, Facebook. You can watch the videos uh, live right there. Um, and we're hoping that our multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual partners will also take those videos and share that with uh, share that with people that they know. Again, I think that people are more likely to click on the link in the first place if someone they know is the one that said, hey, you should check this out. This is important. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be working with school districts? Very much so. Okay. Very much so. We have a dedicated person in our office, a census project manager, uh, and she is working with uh, higher ed, K-12 and libraries, and um, that includes uh, working with the school superintendents, it includes working with the parent-teacher associations, it includes working with the, with the teacher unions, um, and then it includes um, a curriculum that the census has created, K through 12 age-appropriate curriculum for lots of different topics for all ages to learn about the census. Uh, it includes curriculum for college students, both in two and four-year colleges. Um, and includes um, getting people in the libraries all over the state all trained on how to fill out a form. So if someone who relies on the library to check their email or to search for a job or, or to watch cat videos, that someone from the, from the library itself has the knowledge on how to fill out the form. Um, you mentioned that uh, citizenship question. Okay. And... Um, I'm just wondering, is there going to be some effort to, to ensure that people know that question is not on the form? Yes. Uh, it, it's, uh, the question was about uh, the citizenship they, question. They were worried about it yeah, and yeah. decided they're not going to. Yeah. It. So we use a concept called trusted faces and trusted spaces in order to use kind of to like a relational organizing model. That is to say that, you know, meeting with the Mexican consulate and explaining to the staff of the Mexican consulate and groups that serve the Latinx populations to say the citizenship question is not on there, providing the videos to them, providing the collateral material to explain it. So if someone comes in to get help about the census or has questions about the census, they can get that answered. Um, we have a contract with an app um, a maker in California called Community Connect Labs, and they have a tool called a help desk tool it resides as like a chat bot on a website. It can also reside on like a Facebook page. And there's even a number where you, where you can text a question to. We're, we're testing it right now. Essentially, you can text a question in English, Spanish, Somali, or Hmong to this number, and it'll answer you right away in English and Spanish. And if you, question, if you send a question in Somali or Hmong, it's smart enough to realize it's Somali and Hmong. You'll get an auto response right away in Somali or Hmong to say, 
you'll get a live, you'll get an answer from a live human within 24 hours. And one of our Somalia Among partners who will get the question on their phone will be able to answer that question right there and be able to answer the question. So we are hopeful. This is one of the ways that we can um, we can project our power of our staff of 5.25 and make it seem like we've got a whole six people working in our office. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. The question was about how, how do you count people experiencing homelessness? It's a huge challenge. Um, we, we, we estimate, or rather I think the Census Bureau estimates that there's some 10,000 people in Minnesota experiencing homelessness, and I think that undercount, that's an undercount. So people experiencing homelessness are two categories. You have people who are sheltered and those who aren't. People who are sheltered are actually easier to count if only because the Census Bureau has relationships with the Salvation Armies of the world, with the 1010 Curries of the world, with the Dorothy Day Centers of the world, and they can go there. Census Bureau workers can go to the food shelves and, you know, hey, can we help you fill out your form? The bad news is that the Census Bureau counts people, counts unsheltered people experiencing homelessness on three days. I think it's the 29th, 30th of March and April 1st. Unsheltered people, one day. Whole country, one day. One day. You're going to miss a lot. So the good news is we worked with the Wilder Foundation who has their own, um, um, I think I believe it's called like a homeless uh, uh, census, right? They do, a, they do a count of people experiencing homelessness in the state. And they do that, I think it's every three years. And they just completed it. And they were good enough to share the list with us. And so we've then we're providing that information to the Census Bureau, so at least the Census Bureau will know. They know where Dorothy Day Center is, but they might not know that this particular apartment building has one unit upstairs for people who are, this is transitional housing, right? So people experiencing homelessness are very, very challenging to, to get counted. Um, the good news is we've got some great service providers here who are also very keenly interested in the census and who have been terrific partners uh, and are going to help us make sure we get a good count. But I appreciate, I, I'm, I appreciate you asking. Um, two questions. So for those people who answer the census online or by phone where there's no paper trail, how will we know that there's accuracy of information there? That's a great question, and I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, uh, to be perfectly honest, like if you filled out the form and you mailed it, how do you know that that got in, right? True, except for it is the U.S. Postal Office, Postal Service. <laughs> like I said, how would yeah. you know it got in? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so nothing has been considered about, given given all of that, what has been going on with um, hacking, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, that's well above my pay grade, I'll say. Um, but but it, it's, it's, it's a fair question. I, I just, I have so many other reasons I don't sleep already. I'm just not taking that one on. <laughs> so. Understandable. Do you guys have a projection of what percentile of the census uh, questionnaires will be filled out by the various different means? The Census Bureau does, and I can't, I can't think of it off the top of my head. I've got too many other numbers running around my head. Um, Hopefully they, nothing like 50% or something. Absurd yeah, like that, I mean, the I Census hope. Bureau, the Census Bureau just believes that, that people are going to fill, go, like, rush to fill out their forms online. It's just it's going to be so easy. How, how, would, how would you not fill it out online? Now, I, I think what, what, what has yet to be determined is okay, you're going to have people fill it out online, but these are these people who might have mailed in the form last time and now they're, now they're going online? I mean, I don't know how many people didn't fill out their form last time because they're like, well, I mean, I know this is important, but I won't have to walk all the way to my mailbox and put it in there, right? But now that I can just do it on my computer, it's super easy, right? I mean, if you either hate the government or are fearful of the government, the, the, the method by which you sent the information back was probably not the thing that held you back from actually participating in the thing. Um, yeah, so good. That's, that's, that'll be why I don't sleep tonight. Sorry. What, just one last question, my own curiosity. Yeah. Um, mainly because you made a big deal about how 
how um, secure the workers, the census workers were in terms of their training, they can't talk to each other, et cetera, et cetera. So what branch of the government does, um, or to whom does the Census Bureau report? The Commerce government? Department. To the Commerce Department. Commerce Department, yep. Okay. Which is a weird one. Yeah. But it's also kind of weird that I work in the Department of Administration, because no one knows what the Department of Administration is. I get in trouble when I say this, but it's kind of the junk drawer of state government. Because uh, we, we've got the archaeologists and the state demographer and like all these other kind of like weird things, and we're like the landlord for all the state, gov state government buildings in the state of Minnesota. It's kind of an odd thing. You wouldn't think commerce, but commerce. We've got time for one or two more questions. Um, my question is, I, I think, more hypothetical than anything. When you talked about states that don't put a lot of resources into their census work, uh, a state like Texas, for example, which is a high population state, a lot of electoral votes are at, sta are at stake in that. Is it likely that because there's less resources going there, that there would be a sufficient undercount to, for them to lose any of their electoral votes? Texas probably not, but maybe they won't gain as many as they should based on the actual population growth. I think that's- Has there ever been a case where a state has lost for an undercount? I think that part is hard to prove. I can tell you, my first week on the job, I went to a Census Bureau conference out in Providence, Rhode Island, right after the, the, that, that end, end test started. I was at a table, and the, the um, moderator was going around and says, how do you describe success for your state? How, do you, how, how would you know if this was a successful census? And the uh, microphone came to me, and I said, we beat Wisconsin. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> the guy next to me was from Illinois, and he says, uh, Success for us would be we only lose one congressperson. Illinois is at risk of losing two, which means that Illinois, Illinois, the state of Illinois is saying that they believe that they may have lost 1.4 million people in the last decade and would lose two congressional seats as a result. Now, they're, they're, I understand that they're, they're, their legislature has come to the party and is going to put down 20, $29 million towards the census, which is great. But kind of like when you're building a house, it's nice to have all the money when you start planning building the house as opposed to halfway through you get an inheritance and then you're like, oh, man, I wish we had put in the marble countertops. I kind of feel like that's where Illinois is going to be with this thing because they didn't get the money until July. Uh, and it, it takes a long time in state government to like put out an RFP to hire people, to vet people, to do these things. So it may be too late for Illinois to affect that. Maybe, maybe they, maybe that twenty-nine million dollars means they only lose one seat instead of two. Do you know which state will gain the presidential um, The states, um, surprisingly, Idaho is likely to gain a seat. There's been a lot of growth going on in Idaho. Idaho is likely to gain a seat. Texas is likely to gain seats. Um, Montana is possible, right? So, so it's interesting which states do and, 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 and don't grow. Wisconsin is not at risk of losing its eighth seat, and, and we are. But we will beat them. Uh, this is a follow-up on Judy's question. Uh, one consequence of undercounting may affect the number of congressional districts, but how will undercounting, for example, in a state like Texas, affect redistricting at the state level and also funding at the state level for the various programs that uh, federal dollars support? Yeah, so I can, I can give you, because I'm not very familiar with Texas, I'll, I'll talk about Minnesota. If we were to lose an, our eighth congressional seat, that means that the seven remaining seats would grow in population by 105 to 110,000 people each. If you're talking like the seventh congressional district out to the west, western Minnesota, which already goes from the Canadian border to practically the Iowa border, in order to gain another 105, 110,000 people, there's no city of 105 or 110,000 anywhere near that. There, you say, oh, we'll just move the line of Scotia. And now, okay, the line. So instead of what you have to trade is 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 land for people. So that already large district becomes even larger, and that's what will happen in Texas. Now, 
a, a undercount in Minnesota, for example, means, okay, so, the, so we don't change how many members of the Minnesota House we have, but it might change how, how money is appropriated within the state. Right, so the fifteen and a half billion dollars doesn't change, but if the if the Twin Cities the count is really good, they're more likely to get more money, right? And whereas Greater Minnesota might lose out if if they have a decline or if their population is flat or their population declines. So. Andrew, on behalf of the entire League uh, of Women Voters, White Bear Lake area, thank you so much for coming here and sharing all of your expertise and uh, time with us. I, for one, have learned a very great deal and am grateful, and I'm hoping that all of us together can make a difference in terms of community counts. Thank you.